Uh, good morning. Brother, hey there. Welcome to Sunseeker. My name's Luke. It is really early. <laughs> I haven't done a video in many weeks, ever since January. Uh, and um, I just, uh, I'm getting back into the groove. Uh, making a video every day for 31 days kind of burned me out. And then uh, I made a couple. But uh, really, I've been doing a lot of synth collecting and um, and going to uh, conventions <laughs> for the most part. Uh, so last weekend was the New England Synth Festival in here in Massachusetts. And um, they we have a it's sort of a, a spring version and a fall version and then a few summer uh, summer sessions. And so the spring one was last weekend and I uh, was working in the petting zoo, you know, um, the providing synths and stuff. And um, I did a lecture on performing music with grid keyboards. Uh, and it was well received and I've done videos on grid keyboards before, but I just wanted to capture the lecture here, uh, share it with you guys. And it'll be sort of the de facto standard for my channel on how to get started playing grid keyboards. Uh, and so let's just jump in. All right. So, so this is performing music with grid keyboards. My name's Luke Stark. You're looking at the synth seeker YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, most of the diagrams and stuff that I use here are available at my website. So I'm not selling anything. This is not material that I'm going to sell or anything like that. It's just freely available. Uh, enjoy. All right. So this is what we're going to cover this morning. If, uh, and it's like three and it's like 3 AM on a Friday and I just couldn't sleep. So I said, you know what, let's go out and record this. <laughs> so, you know, your mileage may vary. We'll see what I edit and what I keep at, uh, what I keep in and what I cut out. But um, this is what we're going to cover. Uh, I'm going to cover a few terms. Um, some musical terms can be ambiguous, so I'm just going to explain exactly what I mean uh, for this discussion. All right. And then we're going to talk about what a grid keyboard is, uh, and then what are some of the pros and cons of using one. Uh, this is not a replacement for a linear piano style keyboard. Grid keyboards are just an alternate tool. In your tool belt, uh, they have, you know, some pluses and some minuses, pros and cons. Uh, and uh, I really like them and um, I use them for uh, really about everything. I still, I do play piano uh, poorly, but um, I really gravitate towards the grids. And so we'll cover these and then I'll do some demos of how I write melodies and chord progressions using grids. All right. Uh, so let's talk about terms. Okay. I'm going to say chromatic. You're going to hear me say this is a grid that's in note mode uh, and it's chromatic note mode. Well, what does that mean? Um, so instruments have a high note and a low note, right? The highest note that the instrument can play and the lowest note the instrument can play. And the grid is an instrument. And to use it chromatically in chromatic mode means to be able to play all of the notes between the lowest note and the highest note. Right? And we make that distinction because a lot of instruments, grid electronic instruments certainly, uh, have um, a, a mode or two that help you that aren't chromatic. They hide some of the notes so that you can only play certain notes, usually the notes that are in the key and not outside the key. So um, there's this concept of playing wrong notes, um, which I kind of don't agree with, uh, but uh, but the point of this is these grids are in chromatic note. So there's no training wheels. Uh, you can play any note from the instrument's lowest note to the highest note. All right. We're in chromatic mode from lowest to highest. Uh, another term note. When I say notes, what am I talking about? Well, we're talking about Western 12 tone music. Okay. I'm not talking about microtonal stuff much or anything like that. No ancient scales, uh, not scales, no ancient tuning systems or anything like that. Pythagorean, et cetera. Um, we're just doing bog standard, you know, what you hear when you listen to pop music, you know, in the United States and Europe and other, other parts of the world that are influenced by Western culture. Uh, chords. When I say chords in this discussion, what do I mean? It's simplified. Okay. Chords are two or more notes played simultaneously. Okay. That's, that's just what it is. Uh, I'll talk about intervals. Okay. What an interval is, is the measured distance between two notes. Okay. Uh, 
And intervals relate to emotional tension. Some intervals, uh, when you hear them, like this, for example, sound very pleasing. Right? And some intervals sound sound um, emotionally tense. Okay, they add tension, uh, and so. In, depending on the intervals you use, you can have this ebb and flow of emotional tension in your music. Uh, and there are no wrong intervals or notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are no wrong intervals or notes. Okay. There are just things that add tension and things that relieve tension. All right. Um, and we'll talk about that. And then scale. Okay. What is a scale? For this discussion, again, I simplify a bit. Okay. A scale is just a list of notes. All right, and you can make your own scales up, right? Uh, you know, uh, let's uh, when you when you define a scale, you pick a note, and then you pick a few more notes that become the list of notes that is your scale. And uh, I'm going to refer to them as the distance from the starting note. Okay, so an example would be if this is my starting note. Okay, that's zero distance. It is that that note that note is the zero note. And then if I go up three, that's the second note in my scale. If that's the first note, that's the second note in my scale. If I go up five, so that's the second note in my, uh, third note in my scale. If I go up seven, that's the fourth note in my scale. If I go up 10, that's the, se uh, that's the fifth note in my scale. And scales usually repeat the first note again an octave up. And an octave is 12. So my scale would be... That's a scale. Uh, you can invent your own scales. It's totally fine. Um, there are some scales that are commonly used. And commonly used scales generally get names, okay? But you can call it whatever you want. I'm going to call that the wombat scale, okay? Um, it might have another name. Maybe you know. Put it in the comments. Uh, but you, you can just make your own. Uh, it's totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. And what it is is then when you are making your chords and you're making your melodies, you only use mostly the notes inside that scale, unless you want to add tension in which you can use some of the notes that aren't listed in that scale. All right. Um, and as I said, popular scales have names, names like major and minor, right? Or um, some uh, you can use the names of modes and re refer to them as a scale, so the Dorian scale or the Dorian mode. Okay, uh, and then root. All right, we'll talk about. You'll hear the word root. What is a root or a root note? Um, it's just the first note in the scale. So in this wombat scale I just made, that first note, that's the root of that scale, and that is usually. Um, well, we'll get to that. The last term is going to be key, all right? And so if you've got a scale, and the first note in that scale is the root, all right? When you have a, a root that you've actually picked which note it is, A, B, C, D, whatever, and then you give it a scale name, that's the key you're in, all right? So if I start with A, right, and I play the major scale, oh, sorry, minor scale, um, that's A minor, okay? Because it starts on A and uses the minor scale. All right? So if I start on C, right, and I use my wombat scale, I'm in the key of C wombat. All right? That's as simple as it gets. That's what we're going to talk about. Okay. So those are terms. Now, what is a grid keyboard? Well, um, Grid keyboards are a type of isomorphic keyboard. <laughs> Big word. What do we mean when we say isomorphic? All right. Well, if you go to Wikipedia, it says all isomorphic keyboards derive their invariance from their relationship. Yeah, no, stop. I'm not going to read this to you. Um, you can go research isomorphic keyboards. They're fascinating and they come in different shapes. They're not just grids. You can have hexagonal isomorphic keyboards and all sorts of variants. Uh, and they have interesting properties, and you can go look that stuff up if you want. The property we care about uh, is that isomorphic keyboards, the chord shapes are generally the same regardless of what key you're in. And we'll get to what that means. But um, basically, 
you can go look up isomorphic keyboards, especially if you like things like microtonal music or if you're really into music academia, it's a huge hole with no bottom. You can just go do some research, it'll be great. Um, what I'm talking about when I talk about grid keyboards in this little video is if you go buy um, an electronic music making device these days, all right, they're going to have a grid on it somewhere. These things are so ubiquitous in the industry now. You can't buy a controller or a Surface or anything that doesn't have some kind of grid on it, all right? And some of them are really big, some of them are small. The average is around 8x8, but there are like 4x4 grids or 8x16 or, uh, you know, even bigger. And um, they're really useful. They can be used for all sorts of things, for drum machines, for control surfaces, for clip launching, for playing notes, doing performing. And so what this video is going to focus on is a few common sort of patterns that you'll see. You'll see some grids have this pattern on them that looks like a really poorly ga played game of Tetris. Okay. Um, and what this is, is generally this is considered chromatic note mode, which means these are representing an instrument with the lowest note and highest note. And you could play all of the notes in between and the colors on the grid represent or inform you, the player, of which notes are in your key and which notes are out of your key and where your root notes are, all right? So if we, um, if we take, for example, the, the launch pad in the upper left-hand corner, okay, the pink notes are the root notes. So if we're in a key, say C minor, um, all those pink notes are the C notes that are available to you to play. And all of the blue notes are the rest of the notes from the C minor scale. And the white notes are the notes that are outside of that scale if you choose to play them, right? And maybe adding tension or modulating your key or something like that, all right? And so that sort of pattern persists. The pattern will shift like which blue, pink, and white uh, pads are lit up depending on what scale you're in. So the pattern for C minor and the pattern for C major look a little different, but they are, when you're in that key, consistent. Right, and we'll talk about that. But these are the sort of grid instruments I'm talking about here today. All right. So if we think about that grid, it's kind of like a guitar. Um, here I have a guitar that has eight strings, all right? String from lowest to highest on the bottom. Lowest is on the bottom, highest is on the top. And if we were to take this guitar and we were to shrink it down, like, like we put it through the, the dryer, uh, so that it only had eight frets, all right? So now we've got eight strings vertically, and we have eight frets horizontally. That's kind of like an eight by eight grid, all right? You see on the neck, there's that grid there, it's eight by eight, all right? Well, that's the same pretty much as an eight by eight grid controller. Now, the highest strings on a guitar are actually shifted down a little bit. I'm going to just ignore that, okay? That is not the case on grid controllers generally. Uh, but it's really just the lowest row on a grid controller is the lowest string on that eight fretted guitar. And then each, uh, each row as we go up is a higher string. And then the vertical columns are the fret lines. All right. And you play it by tapping on it and pressing it with your fingers, much like you laid a guitar in your lap and we're pressing on the frets on the keyboard, uh, on the fretboard. All right. Uh, so that's the grid. All right. Now there are some pros and cons to using a grid controller. All right. First of all, they're small and portable. All right. Uh, I've, they fit really conveniently, uh, in a laptop bag or something like that. Um, that it's, uh, if you have to, if you've ever had to lug around a large keyboard, like a three and a half octave keyboard or bigger, it's, it can be a pain, right? Uh, it depends on who makes it. You know, if you get, if you've ever tried to move a Rhodes piano, you know what the hell I'm talking about. It weighs a ton. Uh, and yeah, some keyboards are light, uh, but uh, grids are generally very small, very portable. All right. Um, another pro is that grid keyboards, I think, simplify muscle memory, right? Part of learning to play is training your muscles to understand the shapes that you are going to be working with and the shapes that they need to make on the instrument to get certain melodies, certain chords out. Well, those shapes are a little simplified or at least more consistent on a grid controller regardless of what key you're in. So uh, I think it simplifies muscle memory. And because it simplifies muscle memory, it's actually, I feel, easier to sound good fairly quickly using a grid controller, especially because they have lights that light up and inform you as to what notes are in key and what notes are out of key. 
Now, you can get a piano-style controller these days that have little LED lights on it that do exactly the same thing. You tell the, that controller what key you're in, and it lights up the notes to show you what it's in key and out of key. Uh, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong. Again, I'm not saying better than, or I'm just saying different from. Uh, but I find that on a grid, um, you make more progress early on, uh, a bit more quickly, uh, which makes you feel good and tend to practice more, which accelerates the improvement of your playing, right? So uh, in some ways, uh, grid controllers allow you to get better, faster, or at least feel more confident more quickly, all right? Uh, another pro is that because it's a grid and it's consistent, um, it's easier to visualize some aspects of music theory. I'm not going to get into music theory, but uh, things like intervals uh, is m a lot easier for me to see on a grid keyboard than it is on a linear style piano keyboard. This is, may not be true for everyone, but it's definitely true for me. Um, some things just clicked uh, for me easier when I started using grid controllers. Um, now some cons. Um, the range of notes on a grid controller is actually smaller than you think it is, uh, than it looks, right? People go, oh, it's an 8x8 grid, therefore that's 64 keys that I can play, I must have, you know, a 64 note keyboard. And that's not really the case, because on an 8x8 grid controller, just as on an eight, um, that, that 8 fretted guitar, some of the notes repeat. Uh, let me demonstrate here. Uh, so if I pull up this is my sort of visualization for a grid keyboard, all right? So I've got this grid keyboard in the background. All right, so we're going up chromatically. Well, if you were to play over, see how two notes are lighting up? That's because the first three notes on a grid keyboard on the left are repeated uh, on the string below it, on the row below it. So you don't actually have 64 notes available because of these repetitions. You have on an 8x8 controller, you have 64 pads, but you only have 43 notes. So you've got these five on each row are unique, right? And you've got eight of those, that's 40, and then 43, okay? So it, it's actually, the range is a little smaller than you think it is, uh, but that's okay. It's still, you know, three and a half octaves in a tiny package, that's convenient. And it's enough to play. But some things you can't do on a grid controller that you can do on a large piano, like um, do, say, a six octave spread, you know, from the lowest note to the highest note, you know, with your left and right hands, as you can on a piano. You know, you spread, hit the extreme ends of the keyboard if you've got a, a like an 88 key, key uh, keyboard you're working with. Um, you can bang out a seven or, you know, even eight octave spread. You can't do that on a grid controller unless it's really, really large. Um, so, you know, something like the instrument that may be possible on, uh, but uh, on most 8x8 controllers, which is like the sort of standard, uh, you can't do it. All right, so that's a con. The range of notes is a little smaller, but if you're just learning, that's fine. Um, and it does, um, because that range is smaller and due to the shape of the keyboard, it changes how you write melodies and chord progressions potentially, and I'll talk about that at the end. All right, so... Going back to our presentation here, another con, uh, grid controllers are electronic music devices and they require a connection, okay? Uh, you're going to have to connect them both to power um, and uh, to some sort of uh, device they're going to interface with. That might be a laptop or it could be a MIDI host or it could be a synthesizer that understands how to um, talk to a general MIDI controller of some kind. Um, and so it's, it's going to require connection. There's going to be a cable, at least one involved, sometimes two. Now, some grid controllers, um, you have to have a USB connection to, you know, a computer and maybe they even need a specific kind of hardware, uh, excuse me, a specific, uh, kind of software running. Um, you know, uh, an Ableton push really wants to be connected to a computer running Ableton. Um, there are hacks that will let you use that push with other things like Bitwig and various other controllers or just treat them like a MIDI controller. Um, but, you know, you got to have that connection. So that's a con. All right. And then additionally, <laughs> grid controllers are not the simplest devices. And to make full use of them, it's going to require that you read the manual. All right. So, um, so those are pros and cons. All right. So we talked about terms. We talked about what it is. We talked about why you might want to use it, why you might not.
Uh, so let's actually go play with one here. Okay. So let me pull up our grid here. Now, what I'm going to do is because I don't want to, um, because I don't want to necessarily uh, put a camera up here and, uh, and then there we go. That'll work. I don't want to have a camera pointing at my hand because the angles are always rough and I have big hands and they get in the way you can't see. I just built this little tool here that's going to allow us to see what, uh, see what I'm doing. And because there's repetition, right, when I play some of these notes, two notes light up and you can't see my hand so you don't see actually what, um, which pad I'm hitting, I'm going to limit this to a 5x5 five five grid. So now, uh, even though we're not looking at the entire controller, we've zoomed in to just the 5x5 five five area. When I do a chord shape, you can see very clearly what that shape is, and there's no confusion. So, all right, so let's talk about um, intervals and chord shapes and things like that. All right. So uh, if you go to um, my website, uh, go to lukestark.com slash grids, there is a little HTML page with uh, some reference on it, okay? Uh, the first part of the reference is chord shapes for grid keyboards. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the common ones. Um, I don't even try and like do all the chord shapes because honestly, they're not um, they're not really documented in a standard way. I think there's a few references out there, the Push Bible, a few other things um, that will list like every possible chord shape. But honestly, that's not super helpful for you, right? It's like if you were playing guitar and you were memorizing chord shapes. It can be done, but what you really want to do is you want to understand how they're built um, and then experiment and learn as you go. And so that's what this is. This is just a reference to some of the basic shapes. I'm going to go through them very quickly and, sh and explain, you know, how it works. And, uh, and you can then run with it. All right. So the very first shape you should learn is the shape of an octave. Okay. So if we're over here looking at octave, um, an octave is pick any note on your grid. All right. Uh, to play an octave above that, it's going up two rows and to the right two rows. That's an octave. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, arguably the most pleasing interval you can play. It's, and that is an octave. All right. Now you can also get to it if you pick a note and you go to the left three and up three. That's also an octave. All right, you can play them anywhere you can reach on the keyboard that you can see those two. Right, here's one that I can't actually go up three and to the left three because it I run out of grid space. But that one I can. All right, so you have options. All right, once you, it's important to know octaves, okay, because they're the same note. If I have this, there's an octave up. It's the same note here. That one, an octave up, two octaves up, right? Now, if I was doing this on an eight by eight like this, I have a bit more space to work with, right? Now, um, I'm going to keep it as five by five because those extra notes on the extreme upper left and the extreme lower right, those are just repetitions of this note and this note on the grid. But uh, and it gets confusing, so I'm just going to keep it five by five for now. All right. So that's octave shapes. Let's talk about major chord shapes. Okay. Um, the way this diagram works is the dot with the R in it is the root of that chord shape. So it's um, if I'm playing uh, this. Let's see. All right. So this shape is a major shape. Okay. And this note is the root for that chord. All right. So if we're in, uh, if this is a C, this is a C major chord. All right. And it comes in a couple different shapes. You can also play it here and see there's a C there. Well, in my first chord, this was the C. And if I go an octave up, right up to and over to, there's the next shape. So this is the first sort of takeaway. Regardless of what shape you're playing, any note in that shape can be moved up or down an octave, and it's still the same chord, more or less. I'm not going to talk about um, like inversions and things like that. Uh, I don't want to get into music theory. Um, I just want you to understand, here's a guide to some basic shapes you can play with. Okay, so if our chord shapes go 
there as a major. There's another major shape. Another major shape, okay? Um, and there's even more, right? Now, what, one of the things that we like about a grid keyboard, the properties of the grid keyboard, is that these chord shapes are the same no matter what key you're in, right? And if you move around, you just move the shape around the keyboard. So there's a major. There's a major. There's a major. So I can write a little chord progression by taking my shape and just moving it around. See where it's moving? Right? Do a little doo wop. Um, and that's true for all the shapes, right? Major, minor, all the different kinds of chords. And again, I'm not going to get into all the all the types of chords out there. You can go invent your own. For this discussion, any two notes is a chord. So there's a chord, right? There's another, there's another one. And we can move them around. So let's talk about minor shapes. So here are some four basic minor shapes. There's my root, right? We've also got this minor, and then we have all right. Uh, so this is something you can just do on your own. Go grab this. Uh, go hit this URL. Print this out if you want. Uh, go find another guide. There's lots of them out there. Uh, just search for you know chord shapes on the push or chord shapes on the launch pad or chord shapes on grids. All right. But don't fixate too much on memorizing the different chord shapes. Get it into your head that, uh, and your muscles that certain shapes have a certain sort of emotional impact, right? A minor, right? Versus major, right? Versus you can do, if we move on to the next row, we're looking at sus chords, sustained chords, right? That's a sus two. Right, that's a sus4. This is kind of ambiguous what it is. It's sort of a sus2 or a sus4. And you can just move that shape around the grid. Yeah, we're doing jazz. Alright. Uh, and then lastly, we've got some seventh chords. The seventh chord is a particular kind of chord that has, um, <laughs> actually, you know what? I'm not going to get into it. You can go do investigation on <laughs> seventh chords, but the shapes are all consistent. Like this is, right? That's a major seventh and you can move that chord around. All right, same shape. Right. Um, minor seventh looks like this and a dominant. So those are some basic chord shapes. And on a grid, they're really easy to fiddle around with and play with and try and understand, you know, how to make them, how they relate, and come up with chord progressions. And it's also really easy to move around in a key or between keys because the shapes never change. They're always the same. That's one of the sort of key properties of an isomorphic, a grid style a note instrument. All right. All right. So let's keep going. So those are chord shapes. All right. So let's talk about um intervals all right so these two tables um are they're the same thing they're just sorted differently these are the intervals between notes so if i start here right and i say that's the first note in my scale i'm going to use this scale all right that is a minor scale and if this is the first note that's the zero note all right and if i play two of those notes at the same time which you can't actually do unless you've got say two tracks each with a, an instrument um that's unison right and it's very very pleasing it's a very relaxed you know um release of tension as i move up right so if i go to the interval of one that's up one from there so remember our numbering is when you pick a note it's going to be zero one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All right, there are twelve total notes in an octave. 
And when we're talking about intervals, it's the distance between the place you start and the place you end up at. That would be 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All right. So when you're talking about intervals, when you're building chords, any two notes is a chord. If I play an interval of 7, right, that's the shape of that interval. And that is, if you look on the chart, an interval of 7 is a perfect fifth, which is a power chord. All right. Um, and you can move that shape around. Right? Go back to our doo-wop example. Right? I can move that around. The shape doesn't change. If I want to do uh, a, a minor third, that's the shape, right? Up one and back two. So based on these charts, you can say in the color coding, you can get a feel for which intervals add tension and which intervals relieve tension, right? These ones down at the bottom the, with the interval of one and interval of six, the augmented fourth and minor second, right? These add a lot of tension. That's a minor second. That's my root. I'm one away. So two notes on a grid control right next to each other is playing a minor second. And it's very tense. Right? People might say, oh, you're playing wrong notes. You're not actually playing wrong notes. You're playing a minor second interval, which is really like tense. Another one is the augmented fourth or diminished fifth, right? That's, if that's our zero, zero, one, two, two, three, four, five, six. So diagonally connected notes on the grid, right? That's a, the, the devil's interval. It doesn't mean it's a wrong note, it means that it's adding a lot of tension. And so when you play them and you add tension, you want to relieve tension, right? So then you'd play something a little friendlier, right? In that little tiny chord progression I just did, right? I did this chord, this chord, this chord, this chord, for our sort of simplified definition of chord, this one is a perfect fifth. That's pretty relaxed. It's, it resolves tension, right? And then in our chord progression, we add a little tension. Okay, ooh, that's sort of, sort of evil. And then we relieve that tension, right? That's a perfect fourth. That interval there is five. If that's zero, one, two, three, four, five. So we look on our chart, that's a perfect fourth, which is a pretty you know, little less tension, certainly less tension than that, uh, that augmented fourth. So starting, add a little tension, relieve a little tension, and then continue to relieve tension or maybe step back and add a tiny bit more. It's arguable. Some people say that major thirds um, are, are somewhere in, in the middle, like they add a little bit of tension right? But it's all relative. Coming from here, that's less tension, but so is that, right? Right, so you can build your chord progressions based on just intervals, uh, and then deciding whether you're gonna, what the ebb and flow of that tension is going to be. And that applies to melodies as well, right? So if I uh, want to play a melody, uh, right? Um, I'm generally going to pick notes that are inside my scale. Actually, let's flip back. Uh, so here's our grid. Here's our 8x8 eight eight grid. Okay, and that's, I'm going to do it in 8x8, eight eight, so we're going to see some duplicates. Right? Don't panic when I press this note. Uh, two of them light up, that's okay. But I'm also going to turn on the scale key stuff. All right, so this is a simulation of the grid I'm looking at, where these are my root notes. All right, and the blue circles are in key, All right? I'm in C major, so these are C, uh, C minor, sorry. These are Cs, and the blue circles are the notes in the C minor scale. And so when I'm making my chord progressions and my melodies, if I only play 
the pink and blue notes, I'm going to just play notes in my scale, and it's easier to sound, you know, finger quotes, good, right? But when I'm building chords and melodies, uh, I don't have to stay in that scale. So if I go back to that one example I did a moment ago, that's in the scale, in the key. But this one's not. See, that note's not in there. Not this one. That one is. This one's not. You don't have to stay in key you have it because it's a chromatic instrument you have all these options to play all the notes that are outside the key to add tension or drama or whatever um, but anyway going going back to melodies so when i'm playing it i'm just going to arbitrarily pick a note i'm going to say okay my melody is going to go We can simplify it even more. Let's say we're going to do this. There's my melody, right? There's one you'll hear in a lot of pop tunes. All right. Um, and so I am, let's think about that. If this is the series of notes in my melody, where are we going? From here, we go down. Well, if we move this up an octave, same note, we can do some analysis. Well, what is that? So we go from here, we measure one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, if we look on our chart, what is that? That's a minor sixth, and it's sort of in the middle as far as tension. If our melody is going to go here, here, so from our root, right, a minor sixth, so it's a, it's a, it's movement, and then from the here we're going to go here. That interval is what is that? That's seven. That's a perfect fifth. So that that's a resolution of tension, and then from here we go here. Well, if we go up an octave, same notes. From here to here is another perfect fifth. Right? Very, very release of tension. So here's where we start. We add a little tension. We relieve that tension. We relieve that tension again. That's why that little series of notes sounds, you know, good finger quotes to us. Yeah. So you can use this interval chart to decide whether your melody is going to, you know, move into tension and then release it or just, you know, whatever you want to do with it. Again, I'm not trying to explain how to write melodies. <laughs> I'm just saying for performing on grid keyboards, you have a bit of an advantage in that they tell you what's in key and out of key so you know, you know what adds and relieves tension. It makes it easy to understand and to visualize the intervals of what you're looking at. And then if you internalize this chart, you can sort of or just get your ear trained to the point where you can hear you know, that's going to add tension. Um, as opposed to... Right? That, going from here to here, adds tension. Right? But that does not. Or this does not. A little tension here so we go melody goes there up up and then down into a little tension and then we release it anyway um i don't know maybe i'm a poor teacher when it comes to how do i write melodies but i'm hoping this gives you some um, um maybe not help i hope this removes some of the mystery or at least makes it less intimidating to say i'm going to go write melodies and i'm going to build chord progressions because you can just work with a grid controller to stay in key or step out when you feel like it and experiment All right. um so i think that's probably about it um 
So this has been, what are grid controllers? What are grid keyboards? Uh, what are their pros and cons? How do I approach one? Um, and, and what does it mean? So if this was useful to you, uh, great. <laughs> Go have fun. If you make some music with it, uh, send me a link so I can hear what you do uh, and what you've made. And uh, I think that's going to be it. What time is it? It's almost 5 a.m. Oof, I've been at this a little while. Uh, I should probably get up and get my day started. And uh, thanks. And as always, you've been watching Sin Seeker. Have a great week. four chord song. See ya.